I think a lot of people, including those who aren't reality deniers, have a somewhat fantastical mental image of what space travel is. The average person isn't really given a proper understanding of what an orbit is, why astronauts appear weightless, or how rockets actually function. On the extreme end, flurfs and other reality deniers have this idea that after the Kármán line is reached, things just sort of start to float. So here should be Australia somewhere, maybe it's under that deck of clouds over there, in any case it's BEA beautiful. And we can definitely see the earth is round, so particularly me as a geophysicist I'm glad to see that, would be a bummer if not. <laughs> and you know the earth is way more curved than I thought it would look like. I mean, it is so curved. <laughs> this is reinforced by the kinds of things we see in films and television. How many times have you seen a stock shot of a satellite slowly floating past the camera above the Earth? it doesn't really give you a proper idea of how an orbit actually works. However, there is a video game that exists that does a brilliant job of visualizing and explaining how orbital mechanics function. Kerbal Space Program. Most of you are probably already familiar with it, but in case not, I'll run through the basics. This game puts you in charge of the space program on the planet Kerbin, an Earth-like world populated by funny little green men called Kerbals. You are tasked with designing and launching spacecraft, gathering scientific data, and using that data to unlock more advanced technology, allowing you to travel further out and explore a simplified version of a solar system. Kerbin is slightly smaller than Earth and has two moons, one simply called Moon and one smaller, more distant moon called Minmus. Beyond this, there is Moho, equivalent to Mercury, Eve, equivalent to Venus, Duna, equivalent to Mars, Jewel, equivalent to Jupiter, and a few others. The game begins simply by launching ballistic rockets and gathering data from Kerbin itself. During this time you'll learn the basic things like a gravity turn. This allows a rocket to gain more altitude by negating the force of gravity pushing down upon it. Eventually, you will be tasked with the mission of escaping Kerbin's atmosphere, and this is when you begin to learn what delta V is. Delta V is a change in a rocket's velocity that is achieved by burning the rocket's fuel, thus causing its weight to lower. An ideal delta V for a basic rocket is achieved by using solid fuel boosters first, as they weigh the most but have the highest thrust, allowing the rocket to push through the thicker layers of atmosphere before losing that weight and using a more efficient liquid fuel engine to proceed further. In this particular launch video, I've ditched the boosters entirely, as the entire rocket is small enough to escape the atmosphere without much of a push. Additionally, this is a suborbital rocket. It's simply meant to breach the atmosphere and then fall back down so I don't need any fuel while I'm out in space. Next, you will be given a task that initially seems very daunting, Orbit Kerbin. This is where the game really begins to teach you things. Note this description of the mission, just throw yourself at the ground and miss. This is the essential way to describe what an orbit actually is. I once heard Red's rhetoric describe an orbit this way. Imagine throwing a baseball. The ball will travel a certain distance while simultaneously falling before it hits the ground. Now imagine you're the Hulk throwing a baseball. The ball will travel much further while simultaneously falling at the same rate due to gravity before it eventually hits the ground much further away. Now imagine you are so supernaturally strong that you can throw the ball so hard that it travels far enough to fall consistently with the Earth's curve. It will keep falling, but never hit the ground. This is what an orbit really is, and KSP does a great job of visualizing this for you. Here, you can see the gray line representing my rocket's trajectory. As I point horizontally, represented by the nav ball at the bottom of the screen, and fire the engine, the length of the trajectory increases, but I'm still not quite creating an orbit yet. The problem is where I'm pointing. Note that as I go further, 
I begin to point the rocket downward. If you look at the nav ball, you can see I am technically pointing at the ground. I am, quite literally, throwing myself at the ground, and as you can see, once my horizontal velocity increases sufficiently, I miss. I am now in orbit of Kerbin. It's something of an eccentric orbit, as you can see. Its maximum height, or apoapsis, is higher than its lowest height, or periapsis. In order to correct this, I could have done two things. Either increase the periapsis by burning the engines close to the orbit's apoapsis, or decrease the apoapsis by burning the engines in the opposite direction, or retrograde, near the orbit's periapsis. Once you're in orbit, you can really get an idea of how relative velocity works. If little Jebediah Kerman here steps out of the vehicle and lets go, he begins to float away. However, because there's no air resistance, he doesn't fall behind the vehicle. He is traveling through space with it at the same speed, so to speak. This comes into play later when constructing larger vehicles and space stations and performing orbital rendezvous, which is really, really difficult. The last thing I want to talk about, while KSP conveniently demonstrates it for me, is aerobraking. Most of us know the standard image of a spacecraft entering the Earth's atmosphere, looking like it's on fire due to ionized gases produced by the intense speeds and pressure. However, why does atmospheric entry need to be such a hellish experience? The simple answer is that the spacecraft needs to slow down. Remember that an orbiting craft isn't flying, but falling, and in order to hit the ground again, needs to fall a shorter distance. Retrograde rockets would be extremely impractical due to the amount of fuel needed to slow the vessel down, so the other option is called aerobraking, in which the craft uses the atmosphere of a planet to produce friction against the craft and slow it down. In this video, we can see my command module initially increasing speed because it is now falling downward toward Kerbin, but eventually, the force of the air against it causes it to begin to decrease its speed. A heat shield as well as appropriate aerodynamic shape of the vehicle allows us to remain in one piece during the trip, and once the vessel is slowed down sufficiently, parachutes can be deployed and we can splash down. we're no longer falling. Once you progress further in the game, your target becomes the moon, and then you can begin to learn how to throw yourself at another object, and then slow down until its gravity pulls you into another stable orbit. However, I think I've done a sufficient job of explaining the basics, how a cartoony looking game starring little green spacemen can teach real world science, and how things like this could one day educate the future astronauts of our world. Who else is excited for Kerbal Space Program 2? I know I am. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, which is Dead Kennedy in Space. If you want to support me further, consider donating on Patreon or purchasing some of my work through Amazon or Teespring. Thank you, and I'll see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. Live there. On the mode of dust. Suspended. In a sunbeam. In a fast cosmic arena.